Thank you for joining me in this, the final part of our Advent course together. As we began this course, we set out on a journey of faith. I suggested that the season of Advent was more than simply arriving at Christmas Eve with all the shopping done and all preparations complete. This year, we decided we would prepare for the feast by involving ourselves in an inward journey of discovery that would be uniquely personal. To light our way, we lit a candle to represent the Paschal candle, to remind us that we are the Easter people of God and that our song is Alleluia. The flame was to assure us that the fire of Pentecost transforms the deadness of our failure into new opportunities to be his people, alive to that which is eternal. With that promise and the light that is Christ risen in glory, we look back to the record of God's revelation of himself in the Old Testament. There we found a constant calling into new beginnings, new covenants, and the promise of a time when the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon all people, so that all would be able to respond to the invitation to the heavenly feast. We noted how the guardian voices of the prophets were stilled, even as the world became aware that something was about to happen in the affairs of mankind. Everywhere there was the expectation of the coming of one bearing great power, referenced even in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verse 20, if you want to look it up. It was, of course, the acclamation of Herod as a god and his death thereafter. Then in the wilderness, the spiritual home of the Jewish people, John, son of Zechariah, dressed as the prophet guardian Elijah. He began his ministry. His message was uncompromising. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Last week, I asked you to write down the nativity story as it appears in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke to look at what was most important to you and to look briefly at the journeys made by Zechariah, Zach Zechariah in belief, Mary in acceptance and on the roads and the shepherds in response to the angels. I suggested that most people would skip over the first 17 verses of St. Matthew's Gospel and showed how they were an important precursor to the story of Bethlehem. They are an appeal to the unbelievers to recognize the hand of God in their own revelation at the same as the same hand at work in their own time. And there were questions that were raised on the way and which were to be looked at over this last week. Questions like, what have I heard on the journey so far? How shall I respond to what I have discovered on the journey? Shall I see if what I've been shown is true? And if so, how?
I want to pull together some of the threads that we've let loose on this journey. The Christmas story is about our personal journey of faith undertaken in our own time, and not simply a rehearsing of events of the past, important though they are. It is a challenge to open our eyes and look for what God is doing in our time, and to respond to him today. The law of life is change, and the response we make to that challenge changes the course of our lives for good or ill. We tell the Christmas story in our own way, evoking images that are uniquely ours and which involves us in the drama in a very personal way. These images need to be shared if they are to be the means whereby our vision of God is to be enlarged. Because of the special way in which we respect each other's vision, we are transformed into a community of love and shared experience, as were Mary and Elizabeth. We have been looking at what we hear when we listen to the story, and we are being asked the question, how far are we willing to trust ourselves to the way in which God acts in the world? We're being asked to learn that the signs of God's actions have to be recognized for what they are and trusted. They remain signs, not answers to our questions. They invite a response. They invite companionship. Tradition tells us that St. Luke sought out Mary and that his gospel is filled with the details of the story. So let us look a little more closely. Zachariah and Elizabeth. He is a priest, and she is of priestly descent. Both are devout observers of the law of Moses. And yet, they are childless. We need to recognize what this signals to their community, unspoken, unreferenced. It was seen as a reproach from the Lord, a reproach caused by sin. And as such, they would have been a stumbling block for the faithful to whom they ministered. Yet they continued faithful. Imagine then, what the message of Gabriel would have meant to them. It was too good to be true. Never mind the implications for the nation. It was the fulfillment of their deepest emotion and their dreams, and a taking away of the shadow that had hung over them all their married life. Zachariah dared not believe. So much so, but he was involved in it so much that there was little that he could do to stem the disbelief, that sense of if only. Elizabeth, without benefit of angel, knew what was happening and recognized it as the work of God, and she rejoiced. Mary of Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles, the wildest, least religious of the land lived there, the most unlikely area in which to find faith. Can anything good come from Galilee? remarked Nathaniel. Mary, engaged to Joseph of the line of David, what a catch, yet strictly observing the laws of chastity, protesting at the suggestion of immorality. Worse, the child would appear to be the result of unfaithfulness towards Joseph and was punishable with death if exposed. Mary, who is obedient despite it all, because she trusted God. Mary, who visits Elizabeth. God provides the means whereby they can share their vision and find a mutual strengthening. 
Joseph of David's line. We know of his anguish at what appeared to be betrayal at the hands of one that he loved. He was torn apart by God's law on the one hand and his love for Mary on the other. For him, a dream to console him and a demand that he respond in trust. So pause now and reflect on God's hand in all these things. He uses even what the world seems as dead and barren to bring new life. He uses unlikely signs and demands that we trust him. He acts to reassure the faithful soul. there's more, so let us go on. Rome, the world power. Augustus taking a census, ignoring the commands of God about numbering the people, creating chaos on the roads and fueling resentment of the people. Uncaring, might is right. Bethlehem, the house of bread, the birthplace of David and now of Jesus, the name promising sustenance and succor. The reality is a little different. Jesus is born outside of society, outside of chaotic mankind. There is the stable probably a cave, the refuge of the innocent creation, the ox, the ass, the mule, the camel, the servants of chaotic mankind, and the place of refuge for Jesus, the servant of God, and the suffering servant of chaotic mankind. again to reflect upon God's hand in all this. 
He uses the chaos caused by men of power. He uses it for his own purposes. He uses the opportunities of even sinful acts to bring grace to his people. And he acts by becoming the servant not the tyrant. So we go on. There were others outside human society that night as well. The shepherds in the pasture lands and the night air. The unchurch, outside the normal religious rituals of temple and synagogue. Strangely, they bore the title given to the high priest, the shepherds of Israel. They heard and saw things that frightened them, but which, because they were men of courage, energized them. They went to see what they could see, even risking the heavy cost of having to recompense the owners for any losses in the flock to wolves or other predators or those who would steal. Yet they were attuned to God's voice in the natural order, the primordial innocence. The consequences were that their lives were changed. They returned glorifying God for what they had been called to witness. The deliverer of Israel from the Romans is what they saw is what they believed, just like Andrew and Simon at the beginning. God uses those who know enough to be in awe when they hear his voice, and who can respond to the mystery of new life. And he reaches out to them to give them what they can receive. And there's the babe, helpless, vulnerable, dependent upon Mary and Joseph, yet having an effect upon all who saw him, a reminder of God's love in each new life, of new hope, of the wonder of creation, a reminder of past dreams, of past denials of love, of deliberate sin, offering a new beginning.
I've turned from his presence And I've walked other paths, other ways But I've called on his name In the dark of my shame And his mercy as gentle as silence. The wise persons were later, of course, not really part of Christmas, no stable bed or cave, no ox or ass but a house and a child with Mary. Not three, and no certainty of the number or the gender of the company, but presenting three particular kinds of gifts. They studied the stars and the creation and counseled rulers in Persia and further afield dangerous people to be at odds with, dark secrets and occult knowledge. They had been seeking the great power that was to arise in the world, as was the Roman emperor, you will remember, who searched with daily sacrifice each morning in Rome. They alarmed Herod. If in his kingdom, it would mean a change of authority and worship and power. But when they found the child, they gave up the symbols of their power and authority, and they themselves worshipped at the feet of the appointed one. And that response saved them from the treachery of Herod and being warned in a dream, for now they could hear the voice of the Lord their God. They returned from whence they came, in safety. But as the well-known Carol tells us, somehow change. To see a vision of angels is not enough. To dream of heavenly messengers is not enough. To even hear the voice of God is not enough. To be touched by the hand of God requires the presence of a willingness to respond. Obedience that comes from the will, not the emotions or the feelings. Zachariah's feelings were of disbelief. Mary's feelings were of bewilderment. Joseph's were of incredibility. The shepherds were of fear. The magi's were those of power. Herod's, well, he was just devious. It was the exercise of their wills that carried them through that deviousness. To hear and respond with the will may lead the disciples through many uncomfortable feelings and conflicting emotions. It may result in strange and unfamiliar pathways with fear and anxiety as constant companions. To be obedient may take away their peace and their settled life. Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt and the Magi were put in fear of their lives. The way may be hard and costly in material things. And we are the disciples. 
Yet in the midst of all this, there lies the babe of Bethlehem, lying in a feeding trough, seemingly oblivious of all the turmoil raging about his head and in the world. The babe, helpless, vulnerable, dependent upon Mary and Joseph, having an effect upon all who saw them, a reminder of God's love in each new life, in each new hope, in the wonders of creation. A reminder of what might have been had we been different people. Offering a new beginning. I wonder what the babe says to you as he lies there. Perhaps he says, look, I trust myself to your care. I am unafraid. Will you not trust yourself to my care and find your peace? I watch the sunrise lighting the sky, casting its shadows near. And on this morning, bright though it be, I feel those shadows.
God acts then for those who know their need of his presence to enable them to continue their pilgrimage. He acts by emphasizing the possibility of change and by sharing his life and his love with us and for us and his trust in us. During these last few days of Advent, Take some time to ponder the Christmas story. Go adventing. Begin perhaps in silent contemplation. Gently ask, where do I stand in this story? Am I with Zachariah and Elizabeth in the midst of the temple when the birth of a son? Am I with Mary and Joseph in all the anxiety and uncertainty? Am I with the court of Rome? with the knowledge of some great power, but the uncertainty of what it might mean. Am I in the city of David, the house of bread, looking for succor and shelter? Am I outside the stable, looking in, uncertain about what I might find? Am I with the shepherds looking for something promised? Or are you waiting for the babe to smile at you?
so we conclude, as we have done in these three sessions, with a colic for Edward. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your son Jesus Christ came to us in great humility. But on the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>